Let me take you back in time, way back. Back to when dinosaurs practically walked the earth. That's right, it's 1965. <laughs> Cypress Gardens is one of the biggest attractions in Florida. Bush Gardens, well, Bush had a brewery tour, I think. Disney, Disney's in California. But Florida is a huge tourist attraction in 1965. It has a population of almost 5 million. Most of the people are in central and southern Florida. Miami and Tampa are two of the three biggest cities in Florida. And Florida is at the center of the nation's attention, too. The Gemini program is putting men in space, getting ready to send them to the moon. But Florida's business and government, justice, Schools all have to function under the strictures of a constitution that was written in 1885, before there was electricity, before there were automobiles, before there was a Miami. Back then, what's now called Miami was called Fort Dallas, and it was left over from the Seminole Indian Wars. That area, in fact, had been described as a promising wilderness. This map is from the USF Special Collections map collection, and it does show that in 1885, which was the year of the Constitution and the year of this map, most of Florida's population lived within 50 miles of the Georgia and Alabama borders. Tampa was a city. It was poised right on the edge of the growth that railroads and phosphates were going to be bringing. The Yankee carpetbaggers of Reconstruction had just left Florida. And boy, the minute they left, the Floridians wrote their own constitution just as fast as they could. <laughs> and it was not a Yankee carpetbagger constitution. The old constitution preserved segregation in schools. It prescribed the governor's salary, $3,500. It prescribed legislators, legislators' salaries at $6 a day. They also got a dime a mile for uh, reimbursement for their travel. Mixed race marriages were banned forever. The old Constitution had so many details. In the court system, it had particular courts for Hillsborough County. It had particular different courts for Escambia County. It had other particular layers of courts in Dade County. It was riddled with so many local provisions that it was so filled with detail that it couldn't change at all. Nobody could do anything without having to actually change the Constitution. City and counties didn't have any home rule at all. You couldn't do anything beyond what was absolutely routine without going to your legislator and asking and having the whole legislature pass a local bill for you. In short, the old Constitution had so much detail that it just couldn't keep up. By the time it got replaced in 1968, it had actually been amended more than 150 times. The apportionment scheme was similarly straitjacketing. For example, the number of senators was fixed at no more and no less than 38 senators. No county could have more than three. You have very tiny, this is what, maybe going to be uh, 850 people, right? It was completely cattywampus until you figure out that in 1885, that was perfectly normal. That's where the people lived. What did this lead to? Anybody remember when you got people moving into the central and southern part of the state? The northern part of the state saying the same, but they've got all the senators and they've got all the legislators. What this leads us to is the pork chop gang. The pork chop gang, for those of you who don't know, and I think a, a whole lot of you here do, was a name given actually by the publisher or editor of the Tampa Tribune or Tampa Times. I can never remember which one it was, but Clendenin. Editor, okay. 
there was a group of senators and, legis and uh, representatives who represented about 15 to 20 percent of the population, but a majority of the legislator, legislature. No one could do anything unless the pork chop gang thought it was okay. They were very good at controlling the state. That's why they were called the pork chop gang. They brought the pork home in the pork barrels to their home areas. This is a picture of their hangout near Nuttall Rise on the Oscilla River. I actually went looking for that this uh, spring. Um, I found myself down a scary little road. I didn't even get out to take a picture. <laughs> Let me rephrase that. I didn't get out of my Prius to take a picture. I didn't feel particularly like that would be a good idea. So I didn't see this, this, uh, this hideout. But the pork shop gang actually was said to have taken a blood oath that they would always stick together to defend the southern way of life against the encroaching urban, mm, urban Yankees, Jews, people that aren't like us. Pork chop gang is protecting their old way of life against the way of life that's coming into Florida and really taking over the majority of Florida. They completely refused to give up control, even though their constitution required them to reapportion every 10 years. When you hold a majority of a legislature that is supposed to uh, voluntarily reapportion every 10 years, then guess what happens? If reapportionment is going to get you out of a job, the turkey doesn't vote for Thanksgiving. So the pork choppers refused to reapportion. Almost every year, their governors would try to get them to reapportion, but they just refused. Governor Collins in the upper left here, whose papers are here at USF and make fascinating reading, uh, he alone tried two different Constitution Advisory Commissions, but he had a problem. Governor Collins had made the big mistake of beating out a major pork chopper, Charlie Johns, for governor in 1955. So Leroy Collins, who's now acknowledged as one of the best governors in the nation in the 20th century, had a big problem with his own legislature. They were mad at him. He represented somebody who was uh, represented different values, and they had beat out. He had beat out their friend Charlie Johns. So Collins tried to get Constitution advisory commissions, Constitution revision commissioners, the Governor's Committee on Constitution revision. The legislature ignored their recommendations. In the meantime, there were important things that the rest of the state needed schools, roads, hospitals, infrastructure, financing. And as one Tampa legislator put it, change wasn't going to come. <laughs> that might be Mr. Terrell Sessoms right here, former Speaker of the House, who said in an oral history interview, change wasn't going to come unless it was through revolution or divine intervention. Well, whether you want to call it divine intervention or something else, there was a distant storm and lightning strikes began to get a little bit closer and a little bit closer to the pork chop gang. In 1962, the United States Supreme Court in Baker v. Carr said for the first time that federal courts could get involved in the political thicket of state apportionment plans. Remember, this was after Brown versus Board of Education. The Warren Court is trying to force uh, school integration or desegregation down the throats of Southerners. Southerners, Southern whites, are particularly sensitive to the idea that the feds are going to try to make them do something else. The Baker v. Carr decision was so stressful even to the US Supreme Court justices that decided it that it actually contributed to the retirement of two justices. Um, Justice Whitaker unexpectedly and quickly retired uh, due to a diagnosed extreme physical exhaustion. He told his friend Archibald Cox that it was the stress from deciding Baker versus Carr. 
Shortly after that, Felix Frankfurter, whose vigorous 60-page dissent had recently been, uh, uh, been published as a dissent to Baker v. Carr, was found on the floor of his office unconscious. He had had a stroke, and he told his friend Archibald Cox that it was the stress of deciding Baker v. Carr and losing that caused him to have a stroke. In Florida, Baker v. Carr came after a disastrous series of uh, Florida Supreme Court decisions, all in defiance of what the U.S. Supreme Court wanted. Three of these decisions had to do with keeping Virgil Hawkins, an otherwise qualified black man, out of the all-white University of Florida College of Law. Three times the Florida Supreme Court said, we're keeping him out. Three times the US Supreme Court said, no, you're not. You're putting him in. In addition to that, Florida's Supreme Court upheld investigations by the FLIC, the Florida Legislative Investigations Committee, also known as the Johns Committee, back to Governor Johns in trying to go on fishing expeditions to, through the NAACP's membership lists. Um, that got swatted down by the US Supreme Court. The year after that, the Florida Supreme Court had upheld the arrest of a black man and white woman who were arrested for habitually living in and occupying in the nighttime the same room. The US Supreme Court remanded that. So Florida was in no mood to hear that the feds in Baker v. Carr were now carving up another area that they felt that they could worm their way into. You wondered when the picture was going to come in there. <clears throat> the federal courts struck down Florida apportionment plans repeatedly, and there was a routine to it, really. The storm's getting closer now. Lightning is striking more in Florida. Here's the routine. The legislature would reapportion a little bit. Special elections would be held. Everybody would have to run for election based on the new apportionment plan. The plaintiffs in South Florida would sue, saying that, the, uh, that they still had lack of, of representation. The Florida Attorney General would hike his way over to the court to defend the plan. The court would knock it down. Federal courts every time knocking it down. This became a routine, and there were several rounds of it. The pork chop gang, even the pork chop gang, could see the handwriting on the wall a little bit here. And so, like a lot of badly apportioned legislators, legislatures around the country, they began to concede and reapportion just a little bit at a time, just giving up a little bit. Uh, one of the legislators at the time, Emerson Allsworth, described it as a creeping reapportionment. Finally, in 1965, the legislator, led by a somewhat weakened pork chop gang, decides that it'll give Constitution revision another half-hearted attempt. And so they authorize a Constitution revision commission in 1965, and it looks an awful lot like the one in 1955 that they ignored, that Governor Collins wanted. It's possible that they expected to ignore this one as well. So once again, just like in the 50s, members were appointed to this Constitution Revision Commission. It was authorized in the spring of 65. The members were named in the fall of 65, and they did their work through calendar year 1966. Ten appointments by the governor, eight each by the House Speaker and Senate President, five each by the Supreme Court Chief Justice and the Florida Bar, and then ex officio, you have the Attorney General. You might recognize some of these faces. That one is the leader, Chesterfield Smith, then principally known as a phosphate lawyer and lobbyist from Bartow, and also a uh, recent, uh, recent uh, president of the Florida Bar. Governor chose him to be in charge. We also have, uh, let's see, Lawton Childs, Reuben Askew, Bill Young, right there in the middle. Other people from this area, let's see, Richard Earle, I believe, from St. Pete, is right there in the front row. He used to get teased for not being able to see above the well. <laughs> um, and let's see who else. Oh, yes, um, Justice Sebring, Dean Sebring, I believe is that one right there, Dean Sebring of um, Stetson Law. Anyway, this is the group that ultimately 
created, or at least began the creation of, our modern constitution in Florida. So all through 1966, from January 11th to December 18th, this group met off and on in Tallahassee and around the state and did a lot of hard work creating, completely rewriting a new constitution. It was due to turn its draft over to the legislature in late January of 1967. Keep in mind that more than half of these people are legislators, and so they keep getting interrupted all year long by new court decisions, new special elections. Uh, actually, the Speaker uh, of the House de designate to add to the chaos was actually killed in a car crash, and there was a new race for Speaker of the House in the middle of all this. It was a chaotic year. It was an eventful year. Everything happened in this year, not the least of which was that Florida elected its first Republican governor since Reconstruction, its first Republican governor in 90 years, Claude Roy Kirk, Jr. He's the one on the left in each picture. Claude, his beautiful wife, and do we know who this man is? This is Nixon. And then Claude and Reuben Askew, who knew that they would be so conspiratorial. Claude Kirk, also known as Kiss and Claude, was gregarious, charming, and completely ignorant of Florida government. As Chesterfield Smith once said about him, my personal judgment is that nobody has ever been elected or ever will be who knew less about the governmental structure of the state than he did initially. But Kirk became enamored with Constitution. <laughs> but Kirk, yeah. <laughs> But Kirk became enamored with Constitution revision, and he spent three of the weeks of his transition between election and inauguration not working on his transition, but sitting up on the dais next to Chesterfield Smith for all three weeks of the Constitution Revision Commission's final debates. Chesterfield Smith has said that there were days that he could barely get anything done as chair because he was having to explain everything to the new governor, who, let's remember, didn't know anything. The Constitution Revision Commission stopped its work. It finished its product on December 18, 1966. They all went home for the holidays. January 3, 1967, Claude Kirk is getting inaugurated as governor. During his speech, he surprises everyone, except maybe Chesterfield Smith, by calling for a special session of the legislature to start six days later. It's to be dedicated to Constitution revision. He did the next day follow up with the telegram that I found in Terrell Sesame's papers. Remember telegrams? <laughs> Saying that dated January 4th, saying, be back in Tallahassee on January 9th. You're going to work on the Constitution. Never mind that the legislators were howling that six days isn't enough time to put their jobs on hold, finalizing in Tallahassee, get ready to come back up. Never mind that most of them were freshmen. It was a, a hugely new group of faces. They had never worked together as a legislature. Never mind that the, the CRC, the Constitution Revision Commission, hadn't even submitted its final document to them yet. They had to hurry up and do that. But Governor Kirk said, and he actually told me this when I interviewed him three years ago, I wanted the state to know that they had a real governor in charge. It's January 9th, 1967. It's opening day on the hurry up session. The legislators arrive. The chambers are all decked out with all the flowers that Tallahassee florists can muster up. It's full of new faces figuring out where's the restroom? Where's my desk? People with a little bit of seniority like Terrell Sessoms and, well, Bob Graham didn't really have any seniority, but they have both said that they were in committee meetings when final bolt of lightning strikes, and it strikes right in the heart of the Capitol chambers. And what would that bolt be? 
the United States Supreme Court said, I don't care if you just uprooted your life to come do Constitution revision. You are illegal. This reapportionment plan is still no good. And not only that, but we've had enough of you legislators not really doing the job right, so it's out of your hands now. We're going to have the U.S. District Court in Florida decide. We don't trust you anymore. So the place is in pandemonium. Nobody knows what to do. Legislators being legislators are all still trying to come up with new plans, but it's really not up to them anymore. It's out of their hands. The feds have taken it over. As then State Senator Ruben Askew said, even a motion to adjourn wasn't in order. <laughs> they just said, you're null and void. You no longer exist. Four weeks later, the court adopted a plan put together by a bespectacled University of Florida political science professor, Manning Dower. He had cobbled his plan together and sent it in a brown envelope through the mail as a uh, friend of the court. He had put the whole thing together, I'm told, on his living room floor using pencils and adding machines and long division. Anybody remember long division? Everyone had to run for office again. Everyone and his brother was running this time. The new, uh, the new uh, delegation in, in uh, Dade County, there were 22 between all the senators and all of the uh, representatives. There were more than 400 people running in Dade County alone. But interestingly, there was one Tampa representative who was so respected that he didn't have any opposition at all, <laughs> which was really quite something at the time because everyone else was getting in on the act. The new legislature that reconvened in April, this one final time, had Republicans in significant numbers, more than there really had, had ever been uh, since the 19th century. It also was far younger and far more urban than it had ever been. Before I start talking about that, what, so what happened? Who is, who is Manning Dower? And who are the judges that are doing all this deciding? And who's the attorney general that's having to defend all these old, no good, or not good enough um, apportionment plans? Well, they were best friends. One of the three federal judges, it was a panel of three deciding the case, one of them was Judge Bill McRae. Two things about Bill McRae. He had gone to college with Manning Dower. They'd been good friends in college. Over the decades, the McCrays and Manning Dower had gone on vacations together. They had formed a book club together. The McCrays spent University of Florida homecoming weekends at Dower's house. So did that attorney general, Earl Faircloth. So you have the attorney general, the federal judge, and the political science professor all spending fall weekends in the same house in Gainesville. Manning Dower's correspondence files are full of letters from Earl Faircloth saying, I, I can't find my cufflinks, um, and I think they might be under the seat in your car. Um, I won't say full, but more, more, than, more than one or two times this is happening. So they're all uh, very, very tight. Another thing about Judge McRae, before he was a federal judge, he was a law partner of Chesterfield Smith. Chesterfield's son, Chet, tells stories. He says, you know, McRae was the only person my father really revered. And he said, you know, they used to spend Saturdays in my kitchen, in the home kitchen. They would each have a bottle of scotch, and they'd have a big pile of oysters between them. And they would call me, and I would have to come shuck the oysters. And then I could go back out and play until they needed oysters again. And they would keep that up all day until the oysters and the scotch were gone. So you have a very tight, a very small group of people that are controlling this. 
Uh, I'm not implying nor do I believe that there was anything improper going on, uh, but I found it notable how close the ties are and how small the circles are. Another interesting thing about Dr. Dower's apportionment plan, what it did was it put the county of Charlie Johns, which is Bradford County, next to Alachua, into the same legislative district, I believe the same house district, as Alachua County. So you have a much larger, much more liberal county basically swamping the votes of a smaller, more conservative county. Why might he do that? Well, um, this is a little bit off topic, but the FLIC, the uh, Legislative um, Investigation Committee, had persecuted homosexual professors, mainly at two state universities, University of Florida, University of South Florida. University of South Florida owed its existence to Charlie Johns's political nemesis, Leroy Collins. Alachua County is also persecuted. Dr. Dower, a lifelong bachelor, was not, as far as I can tell, ever uh, persecuted by the Johns Committee, but he certainly came out vehemently against the whole idea that you would persecute uh, people on grounds like this. So I have never found anything that says that Dower made this legislative decision, apportionment decision, because of Johns's decision with Flick, but I do find it to be an interesting um, thing to notice. So back to the Constitution. The Constitution at this point is in the hands of the legislature. They couldn't work on it when they were supposed to in January of 67. They come back in April 67 brand new. They've only been reelected a week ago under the new apportionment plan. You might expect them to tackle that Constitution again, but they don't. Well, I don't know why they didn't. I can't understand. There was some economic development scheme or an amusement park or something going on in Central Florida that had a legislation package that somehow took greater priority over the Constitution. Um, I made the mistake of innocently asking um, Bob Graham in an interview, why didn't, why did you let Disney take precedence over Constitution revision? And I'll read you what he said. He said, <clears throat> well, Ms. Adkins, if you had the choice of going shopping for big flat screen TV or sitting down figuring out the composition of the Fish and Wildlife Commission, which one would you do? <laughs> Eventually, after several tries, because it was hard work and there was a lot to work on, after several tries, two special sessions in 1967 and a final one in the summer of 1968, the new legislature did get to work. It worked hard. And it finally agreed on an adaptation of the draft that the CRC had supplied it. Terrell Sessoms worked very hard on it. He was one of the leaders uh, trying to push this through. They were finally able to agree on July 3rd, and the newspapers were able to announce on July 4th, 1968, we've got a new constitution. It's going to go on the ballot. The people get to vote in November. And by the way, we have Tampa and St. Pete to thank for that. Um, it's, uh, it's popular among, I don't know, Florida history geek circles to say that, um, that the Constitution passed handily. In fact, were it not for urban areas, it would not have passed. A very large majority of numbers of counties voted no on the new Constitution. But Dade, the Gold Coast counties, uh, Hillsborough, Pinellas, Alachua, Volusia, voted yes. Orange County, no. Sarasota, no. Leon County, no. Um, but it was enough to put it over the top. So that brings us up to 1968, which is just the beginning. Don't worry, I'm not going to keep you here for another 30 minutes. 
But I think it's worth asking a couple of questions. First, isn't it unlikely that this passed in the first place? If you think about it, the legislature had had several SOPs that they were throwing to Constitution revision. They had allowed Constitution revision members to try and just be ignored by the legislature. How likely is it that in 1965, the governor would come in so differently? Who knew that you'd get this hurricane named Claude Kirk who decides that his number one priority is constitution revision? The governor who, you know, the governor who was in place when the whole thing was started in 65 didn't much care about constitution revision. Um, who knew the legislature would be so changed from 65 to 67? It was dramatically changed. I don't think the pork choppers counted on that. What was the key? I think the Baker v. Carr case was probably the key. Because if you think about it, until, until the federal courts decided they could start to get involved in state apportionment, there was nothing to threaten any of these state legislatures. As Terrell Sessoms said, you, you know, you can look to God or you can look to revolution. I don't know where it's going to come from any, anywhere else, but it came because of a very unpopular thing at the time, and it's still unpopular with a lot of people, which is the idea that the federal government can monkey with what the states are doing internally. If that hadn't happened, there would not have been a revolution in the Florida legislature, and there would not have been a new constitution. Second, I think it's fair to ask, if the new constitution is so great, why does it seem so crazy? This is where pigs and pot come into play here. Whose crazy idea was it to make this thing so easy to change? Does anyone have any, I know I've got a group of extremely knowledgeable people right over here. They're sort of my, you know, they're, they haven't heckled me too badly yet, but does anyone have any idea why they would make it so easy to change? Well, I talked with a couple of the people who were involved in that 1966 Constitution Revision Commission and the 1967 and 8 legislature. And uh, one fellow in particular, Bob Irvin, he just died this year at age 97. He said, the proudest thing, my proudest accomplishment with that constitution is the, is the citizens' initiative. The initiative that citizens can get together and say, we want medical marijuana to be legal. Let's get enough names on the petition and put it up on the ballot. Or we want to ban gill nets. Uh, because we think that uh, fish are not being caught properly. Or we think it's terrible the way pigs are treated when they're pregnant. They're tethered. That's wrong. We need to put that in the Constitution? Our organic, our organic law that describes how our government should be structured and puts, only, you know, puts limitations on it? So, so I said, um, Ms. Irvin, I'm... I'm glad you're really proud of that, but has that worked out the way you thought it would? And he said, yes. He said, I knew, he was a lobbyist for decades, he said, I knew working with the legislature that it is very often just not responsive to what the people want. They're going to do what they are going to do. I knew that the people needed a way to change their own body of law without having to go through the legislature. So he said, if the people have shown what they want, then the people have shown what they want. I'm proud of that. So that was one way to look at it. You know, there have been ways to try to tighten back up on that. Um, we famously, several years ago, had the, uh, the uh, amendment that said, you know, this thing's too easy to amend. Let's require it to be now uh, uh, ballot initiatives, amendments won't pass until they're 60%. Uh, it passed by 55%. <laughs> but it got on, so now we have to have 60%. Um, and another, another thing, and somebody mentioned this at lunch. Was it you? Here's what I think we should do. So here, here. 
We need to amend our Constitution so that citizens can have initiatives to create new statutes. I'm, I'm depressed to say that this has come up before and hasn't ever been passed. I know that it came up in, 1970, in 1997 when Mr. Frank Morsani here was on uh, one of the Constitution Revision Commissions. Um, they're, in fact, at one of the public hearings, and public hearings precede each of the Constitution Revision Commissions. Um, at a public hearing, there was a fellow in Gainesville, of course, who said, I think pot should be legal, and by the way, I also think that there should be citizens' initiative to make statutes. And I thought, well, that was, you know, that's actually smart of him because he wants it to be legal, but he understands it probably doesn't really belong in the Constitution, that it should probably be a statute. Um, but I know the 97, because, because we still don't have it, obviously the 97 um, CRC did not, um, did not pass uh, the, the citizens' initiative for statutory, for statutes. So we'll try that one next time. Um, another way that this darn thing is so easy to amend is this whole idea that there are, every 20 years, m a new Constitution Revision Commission. Whose crazy idea was that? So we have the 1966 group that was created to recommend a constitution to the legislature. It did that. And the final version of that constitution said, by the way, we agree with Thomas Jefferson that a little rebellion every now and then is a good thing. And so we are now going to say in 10 years and then every 20 years after that, there's going to be another constitution revision commission. And it's going to take an another look at the entire document and see what needs to be changed. Now, why might they have done this? I think it was because they had just lived through dramatic change and they knew what it was like to live under an antiquated constitution. And I think they wanted to spare future generations of Floridians from having to live with that. So they built change. They built easy change and big change right into the new constitution. So, in some ways, it adds to the laughing stock that Florida is because we can, we can have pigs in our constitution um, and, and have the, the kind of net that we're allowed to use fishing in our constitution. Uh, but on the other hand, we understand that it's because the founders of our modern constitution wanted to build, they wanted to build the power of the people into the constitution, and there's something to be said for that. I'd like to talk a little bit about the work that the later revision commissions did. There was one in 1977, and there was one in 1997. And we actually have a couple of people that couldn't be here today that were on the 1977 commission. And I don't know if you can see, this is, so we, you know, we had the beautiful formal picture of the 1966 group. The 1977 group, it's caricatures. So Jan Platt, whose papers are also in special collections, um, she had a lot of useful stuff. And then just a couple of weeks ago, she brought in this wonderful framed caricature. And I thought I would use it today. This 1977 group is sort of infamous for not having any of their ballot uh, recommendations pass at the time. They've had a lot of them pass since then. The right of privacy, they wanted to put it on in 1978. It passed just two years later. The 1997 commission learned from the mistakes of the 1977 commission, and they had much better luck. And um, they also did some, uh, some good things for the state. Um, stronger language supporting public education, um, fair districting, which is one that you didn't get at the time, but you got later. Um, so one of the things that I've learned doing all of this research is and, and members of these commissions have said to me, don't just look at 1968, 78, and 98. Look at what they started and how those issues have gone across. If they don't get past then, they get past later. So um, what are some of the issues that we think might come up? Now, I personally think that education is never going to go away. 
uh, both K-12 and higher education. Um, what are we going to do about Common Core? What are we going to do about vouchers? What are we going to do about funding? Is there going to be a Board of Regents? If so, what form will it take? These are all constitutional issues, potentially. Um, privacy. You know, privacy, I'm told, was born uh, was born because lots of people didn't want to have to expose their, pardon? Divorce. Divorce. Right, right. Because Dempsey Barron didn't want to, um, <laughs> didn't want to expose his divorce records and financial records too. What has it been used for since? Well, it's been used for things like a right to abortion. So y you sometimes get unexpected bedfellows uh, on issues like this. What does the right to privacy look like in the future? Well, let's think about drones and, uh, you know, traffic light cameras and things like that. So that's definitely an issue. Any other thoughts? I know a lot of you are quite well versed in all of these things, and we're, I'm now essentially done with the formal part of my talk, and I really, I would, I would welcome suggestions or thoughts from any.